All right, hey guys, here is um, a little overview of blood. Um, I know we're in the middle of our um, project and you guys are going through all of these topics, but I wanted to give you just a little bit of a framework so that you could be able to see um, what some of the high points of the topics are. And so we're gonna run through these, um, try to do this as quickly as possible. So first thing, composition of blood, which you all should be researching. Um, blood itself is a mixture. It's not just its own particular substance, and it is a mixture of cells, enzymes, proteins, inorganic substances, and we'll run through what some of these things are. Um, when we talk about inorganic substances, we're talking about things like um, like metals, like iron, okay, and the hemoglobin. <clears throat> so, the four main parts of blood. You have your um, erythrocytes, okay, these are your red blood cells, uh, and those actually have nuclei, um, they carry DNA. Uh, leukocytes are white blood cells, uh, you probably know a little bit of white blood cells when it comes to like immune responses. Um, Platelets, uh, these are clotting factors. So whenever you cut yourself, you don't just bleed to death. Uh, your body actually starts doing this really awesome cascade reaction uh, with uh, fibrogen in your blood. Uh, and it kind of caps off and makes this mesh that stops your body from bleeding to death, uh, which is helpful. Uh, and then plasma, which is the liquid part. It's actually yellow in nature, but you don't see that. Um, so. That's a breakdown of just what blood is. Now, when we talk about antigens and antibodies, these are really important when we talk about typing blood um, and when we talk about donating blood as well. Uh, but antigens, these are proteins that are located on the red blood cell. Red blood cells kind of look like this disc that's uh, got a that's concave on both sides, uh, and so um, these are these proteins that are located on the surface of the red blood cells. Um, and these are responsible for your actual blood type. So if you have type A blood, then you have type A antigens. Antibodies are the opposite of an antigen, and they basically actually bind to an antigen. Uh, and so uh, these antibodies will recognize and bind to a specific antigen. And so when uh, you have your an antibody that reacts with a sp uh, specific type of antigen, they will clump up together. They're kind of sort of like a clot, uh, but they will clump up together, and that is called agglutination. Now, when we talk about our blood system, the way that this works is, like I said, with type A blood, you have A antigens. But when it comes to antibodies in your blood, you have anti-B antibodies okay um, and so with type B blood you have B antigens and you have anti A antibodies now so if you were to mix type A blood with type B blood that anti A antibody would attack and agglutinate with that A uh, with the type A blood okay with that A antigen and it would uh, and it would cause that blood to basically clot and so you can you know you can't actually donate blood between type A and type B. Same thing with B. If you put type A in it, that anti-B antibody would attack the B antigen. Um, AB blood has both of the antigens, but it doesn't have either one of the antibodies, and so uh, it does not agglutinate. And then type O is different because it does not have A or B antigens in it. So when we talk about being able to donate, um, blood type A, you can donate to A or AB. I'm not going to read through all of these. You can see this. Just a couple of things to point out um, is that with AB blood, it can donate to AB, but it can receive from any of the other ones due to the fact that they are lacking um, because uh, AB doesn't have the, the anti A or B antigens. And then O can donate to everyone, but it can only receive from O. So, one other thing to talk about, and we'll only hit this at a, at a surface level right now, is the RH factor, the rhesus factor. Um, it, whenever you talk about blood being a negative, O positive, um, that positive or negative is this RH factor, this rhesus antigen. It's also sometimes we're called the D antigen, and I would know that just for trivia's sake for a quiz. Um, and so if you have the D antigen, you're RH positive. If you don't have the D antigen, you're RH negative. Uh, and this is important whenever we talk about, about blood being able to be received or not, and it complicates our, our, our chart from the previous page a little bit. Um, if a person is RH positive, then they can receive either RH positive or RH negative blood. But if you're RH negative, then you cannot receive, you can only receive from RH negative um, donors. And so, uh, anyways. 
That's one other thing to know when we talk about blood and blood typing in the whole ABO system. Okay, so genetics of blood. Um, there's only three um, major types of blood types, A, B, and O, okay, when we talk about alleles uh, for the way that this works out. And so you should know how to do a Punnett square. I will tell you this just so you know that if you do know how to do a Punnett square, A and B are dominant alleles, whereas O is a recessive allele. And so um, anytime you're going to have an A come up against an O, it's going to win out, or a B against an O, it's going to win out. And so you can have some different types of combinations to make that, that blood type there. Um, and so, like, we have an example here for the Punnett square, and you can kind of do this mentally. What if you have, what are the possible blood types for the offspring belonging to a type AB female and type O male? Well, if you did your square, you'd have AB at the top. You would have O is, is recessive, so you have to have two O's, so OO. Uh, and when you put that together, your possibilities are that you would have either type A, because it would be AO, or B, BO. Yo, body odor. Okay. Um, all right. So let's get into forensics a little bit. Um, there's three questions an investigator must ask. One is something actually blood uh, and not just a particular stain or paint or something along those lines. Is it human or animal blood? Does it actually belong to whoever was attacked? Did it belong to our little pet Scruffy? Um, or did it belong to the steak that you dropped on the floor? Uh, and then whose blood is it, obviously? When we talk about a presumptive test, a presumptive test is where you are assuming something is blood, so this, this test can tell you whether or not, within a reasonable doubt, if the substance is blood, so then it can have further testing. And there's two ways to do this, really more, but uh, we call this a color test. One is Castle-Meyer test, as you can spray it onto a stain, it turns bright pink. That's where if you're testing actual visible blood. And then luminol, which we'll look at this in class here pretty soon, it actually glue, glow, glues. It glows a luminescent blue, uh, and this would be something if you have a stain that's cleaned up, or somebody has even used bleach to try to clean something up, where you can see residual stains sometimes years after the fact um, using luminol. Um, when we talk about testing between human and animal blood, for time's sake, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but you need to know that this is a precipitin test, uh, and what they do is they take human blood and they inject it into an animal usually a little bunny rabbit. I know that seems really strange. But what happens is the antibodies inside that animal, they start to um, see this invading blood and they make a anti-serum to attack that blood. You can then take um, that anti-serum out and you can put it into a capillary tube, a really thin tube, uh, and then you can put in a sample of the blood that you're wanting to test, whether or not it's human or animal, and then you see if there is a band form between the two, okay, to determine whether or not it's human or animal. Um, then answering that last question of whose blood is it, that's where you would do a DNA analysis, um, and that is contingent on a bunch of factors, one of them being uh, are there intact nuclei in the red blood cells and um, how old the sample was and what happened to the blood and, how, and, and a lot of other things like that. So. Um, when we talk about characterization, class characteristics versus individual characteristics, if I just find blood, I can probably test it to see what species it belongs to, what the blood type is, the Rh factor, does it have any diseases, and that can give you that can give you a class of evidence, meaning that it could point to a group of people that have this type of blood type, or or it can rule some people out. Um, but unless if you're if you're not able to do DNA analysis, um, then that's all it can tell you. Um, but if you're able to actually extract DNA from it, then it can tell you and point you towards a particular individual. Let's look a little bit at blood stain um, pattern analysis or a blood spatter. Um, some of the factors that we have here, appearance, distribution, and location. Um, so um, here are some different types of blood stains you may see. Um, a passive stain, that's a dripping stain, okay, say that you have uh, cut your arm and you're standing with your arm down and it's just kind of dripping down your hand onto the floor, that's just gravity causing that stain. Um, a transfer stain would be obviously if you had, a, had uh, blood on your hands, you touched a surface, you wiped it, um, that's going to transfer that blood to it. And then a projected stain would be dealing with like actual blood that is coming from a body and it's, and it's uh, in the projection of that is causing it to land on the surface. 
Texas. Um, and there's even more types of projected stains. I don't think it's covered in this lecture, so I'm going to go ahead and mention it. There's arterial stains where if you cut your carotid artery, you have that high blood pressure that would cause blood to, um, to eject from the body very quickly. And so you have these kind of stains on the wall that, um, that kind of these arcing stains um, where a venous stain would be more like the blood flows from the body uh, and would cause pooling to take place. And so um, here's a couple of things to know. Surface texture can affect a blood drop if it's a rough surface. Um, okay, the pointed end of a drop when it strikes the surface, the pointed end points, it faces the direction of travel. And so if you have, and we'll look at this, it, we'll actually do a lab on this, but when a droplet hits, it kind of slides down and the pointed end of it tells you the direction that it came from. Um, also, we'll look at, at in class a little more about um, angle of impact, but you can measure the width, length of the drop, uh, and then get the inverse sign of it. It's a really simple calculation, and that can tell you, um, within a reasonable amount, the angle that that drop came from. Okay. Um, <coughs> One of the things that you can do, I mean, you kind of see this string back pattern on the picture here, uh, is that you can use those angles then, and you can draw lines through the long axis of the blood stains, and you can string back, and you start to get this, this kind of um, area of convergence that seems to show where that blood came from. So it might tell you well, like how tall an individual was, if they were standing when they were shot or whenever they were hit. Uh, and so you can, you can track that back and, and start to see um, where the blood came from. Now, real quick, let's talk about uh, our favorite topic, body fluids. Um, saliva. What does it consist of? One, obviously water. Uh, then there is mucin, which is for swallowing, okay, kind of a, the oily component uh, to our saliva. Um, amylase, uh, which is an enzyme for digestion. As soon as you put food in your mouth, it starts to digest. And then here are some that's really important for forensics that you need to know are buccal cells. These are cheek cells, um, and so that's why we do a lot of swabbing of cheeks. Uh, and this is a, as it says here, a good source of DNA. Um, these are, it's mostly associated with sexual assaults, bite marks, um, and so there's a couple of different tests there. You can do a starch and iodine solution similar to what we did on fingerprints whenever we did that iodine lab on fingerprints. Um, but uh, and what, what happens is you use the starch, when you spray it, it, the amylase starts to break down the starch, and then if it's saliva, it'll turn purple or blue, and then it will start to fade. Semen consists of a lot of things, but here's the, the basic overview of it. Water as well. Um, spermatozoa, okay, which are the actual sperm cells. Um, enzymes, and then inorganic salts. Okay. Now, with semen, there are presumptive tests where you can fluoresce it under UV light. It will show up, and you can, you can at least start to think, okay, well, if it doesn't fluoresce, it's not semen. So if it does fluoresce, um, then... Um, it will cause it to fluoresce. Um, acid phosphatase is something you need to know. That's an enzyme um, that's secreted by your pro by a man's prostate, uh, and that whenever it will turn purple with an acid phosphatase test, um, and it indicates that semen is there. Then you could do a confirmatory test. You can uh, you can use a microscope to determine if there's actually spermatozoa or spermatozoa present, uh, and then you can also do DNA typing. Sometimes I mean there's actually a lot of um, exceptions to some of these things, but we won't get into those. And then finally, urine, everybody's favorite topic. Um, and so this is really going to be used more for determining um, the presence of drugs in, in the body. Uh, the EMIT or EMIT, enzyme multiplied immunoassay technique, um, can uh, tell you how different drugs bind with that urine and you can actually go in and you can test for different drugs and there's a whole subclass that I'm actually taking an entire class right now where we're talking about um, urine analysis of, for drugs uh, and so uh, it goes a lot deeper than that but that's as far as we're gonna go for our class all right so um, study up. Know that, I mean that's kind of basic overview of stuff I ask you to know a little bit more than that with for the project but uh, you can see that you can cover these topics uh, in a pretty um, in a in a pretty comprehensive way in a short amount of time. All right. See y'all later.